yeah, we're a bit late to the party. Google Deep Dream's been out for a while, but it follows on nicely from our neural network talks. Let's talk about how it works. Google Deep Dream is a strange computer program that outputs kind of psychedelic, trippy images. This is one off the Google's gallery, and it's some kind of strange, I mean, what is it, well, we don't know, kind of strange, there's sort of, sort of a viaduct here, and that looks like a fountain and some grass. Weird sort of artistic image, but generated entirely by a computer. Now at the time this came out, most people were having lots of fun playing with this and playing with online generators, but no one you know, really talked about deep down how it worked. It kind of looks like sort of digital Salvador Dali, doesn't it? It does a bit, yeah. And I think we quite instinctively quite like the idea that computers can do art in some way. For what it's worth, it's not quite art yet, I don't think, but we're, we're, you know, it's a bit of fun. It also has some interesting implications as to what a neural network is doing underneath. Um, that we talked about a bit during the video where we looked into a network and saw it classifying digits. This is a similar kind of thing where you can see that the lower level layers are doing some things and the higher level layers are doing other things. So let's try and break down what it's doing and then we can see some fun images I ran myself. Now Google's GoogleNet, which is the name for Google's network that they released in, I think, 2012, as part of the uh, ImageNet competition, is quite complicated. Right? They have these modules of groups of convolutional layers called inception modules, which is a very cool name for something which is probably not quite as cool as, as that, but it's a cool name. The idea is that you go deeper and deeper into the network and you get more and more powerful classification out of it. Okay? But at its core, it's still a classification network. So it's saying, what is this a picture of? It's a picture of a cat. 100% right? confident, picture of a cat, definitely. Right? Oh no, it could be a dog. Right? So um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a network, but I'm going to draw my sort of standard multi-layer network that's got nothing to do with convolutions and nothing to do with Google Net because it's easier to visualize. Um, so I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but on the other hand, the same things apply to this small network I'm going to draw as to the big network. So remember that we have some input neurons here, and then we have some intermediate neurons, and then finally our output neurons. Now, if people think back to the videos we did on this, this neuron here calculates a weighted sum of all of these neurons, and this one calculates a weighted sum of all of these neurons. So if we were going back to our house analogy, right, this one here could be number of windows, this could be square footage, this could be if it's got a pool or not, Right? And this is taking some combination of those things and trying to start to work towards the price for a house. And this one takes some combination of those combinations and starts working towards the price of a house. Now, when we talked about convolutional networks, these neurons are replaced with image convolutions, like Sobel edge detections and other things, right? where the actual convolutions themselves are learned. So the early layers are going to be finding lines and corners and things like this. Later on, we're going to start to find objects, boxes, circles, things that have multiple lines and corners as part of them. And finally, at the top, we start to move towards actual objects we're trying to classify, cats and dogs and bikes. And then finally, we get an output that lights up if it's a cat. Right? That's the key. I, I mentioned this very briefly in a, in a video, and I'm going to mention it again very briefly, because backpropagation is not for a computer file video. There's a lot of detailed analysis of backpropagation online for people who are interested in it. Right? It's very mathematically complex. It talks a lot about partial derivatives and, and multivariate calculus and things like this. We won't be doing any of that in this video, so please don't turn it off. Right? But the idea is that if we put an image in at this point, we can calculate these weighted sums and we can propagate it through and get a value out that says how much of a cat is in this image. Right? It's, it's essentially what we're doing. When we actually want to train this network to do something, what we do is we know we're looking for a cat, so we try and change these weights to better predict it. So we have something called a cost function here, C, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to work out how we affect C by changing this particular weight here. So it's a relationship between the weights and the cost function. Now, when we train a neural network, what we do is we try and minimise this cost function. So the cost function might be something like prediction accuracy or Euclidean distance or some sort of softmax, right? But the point is that this gives us a value of how good our guess is, and then we alter all our weights going backwards to say, let's just change these weights a bit so that that error goes down and we get a little bit closer to the right prediction. All right. Um, so we go forward to get our prediction, we calculate the error, and we propagate the error backwards. So that's all the background you really need to know how Google Deep Dream works. What Google Deep Dream does is forget the cost function completely. We, we've already trained the network. What we want to do is maximize these values here, or these values here. So, Think about it, if this is a picture of a cat, right, so I'm putting in a picture of a cat here, then what's going to happen is it's going to create a weighted sum 
and then one of the cat neurons is going to light up. Right? But also, if you think about this layer, if we're working our way backwards, it might be because this one lit up, which is maybe there's ears, and this one lit up, which is maybe pores. And maybe this one lit up because here was a few lines in a row, and this one is sort of furry texture or something, you know, and we're getting lower and lower level as we go through. And, and in the end, it's because this one lit up, which is edges, and this one lit up, which is corners in a certain place. The values in here influence the values here and here and here and here, and then end up converging on our thing. So what we want to do to make our Google Deep Vim images is change the image to make these bigger. Right? So if this is the amount of ear in our image, if we can just make that as big as possible, we can say more ears, please. There's a bit of ear going on there, but I want more. I want more ears, I want more paws, I want more bits of cat. So instead of minimizing this cost function, we're maximizing the sum of these, or the squared sum of these. Let's not do any more maths, right? Let's look at some pictures. I have my landscape image. Now, if it's looking very boring to you, it's because I haven't passed this through Google Deep Dream yet, right? But what I do is I pass this input into the Google Deep Dream, and for every area in the image, it starts to light up some of these neurons. Because maybe, although this isn't a picture of a cat, maybe there are some kind of catty features in it. You know, like the edge of a leaf might be kind of the same shape as an ear, or this texture of this grass, kind of the same texture as fur. So some of the same neurons are going to light up. Right? So what we do is we then try and make those bigger by altering our input image. Okay? So just like we would try and train our network to get better, we train our image to get better, to be more of these features. Now, of course, this network is trained on lots of things other than cats. So anything that looks at all plausible, it's going to try and maximize that effect. So this is a picture I ran through it here. OK, we've done some strange things. In the sky here, we've got the kind of roofs of buildings appearing. And then down here, we've got some animals appearing. And I don't know what that is, some kind of Dalek. And then this weird animal here, if we zoom in on that, I, I mean, it's anybody's guess what kind of animal that is. But this is what's so cool about Google Deep Dreams. You don't know what you're going to get, and it's going to depend on your input image. So, you know, the features that it found in the input image, oh, that feature looks a bit like a bunch of lines, which in turn look a bit like the edge of a, of a cat's head. Make it look more like that. And if you keep doing this process, it starts to converge on weird animals that have interesting features. So is that multiple iterations? Yes. I think it does about uh, 40 iterations by default. Right. So it... Um, tweaks the weights of the image uh, 40 times. In actual fact, Google Deep Dream does it at different scales as well, but we, I've sort of brushed over that because it's not hugely important, but it runs a small version of the image first, makes it a bit bigger and runs it again, makes it a bit bigger and runs it again. Um, so you can then take this image and put it back into the front and make it more. I want more of these weird shapes and weird animals. So I take this image and I put it in and I get something that's really weird. So it's the same, but, but just more of it. It bears no resemblance really. I mean, there's a tiny bit of tree left here, but there's, it bears very little resemblance to our original image, apart from this generic area of ground and the sky. But on the other hand, we've got all kinds of, there's a, there's a weird car appearing here and some actual full on buildings starting to appear. Because later on in this network, some of these neurons are going to be representing building shapes. And so it's trying to make it more building shape. What's this for? Right? Why are we doing this? I mean, that's a, that's a question you'd have to ask Google, because I'm not entirely sure. But no, it's, there are two things. It is fun, right? So mostly it's fun. Like most people aren't interested in what a neural network is doing underneath. They like cool, trippy images. Um, one of the problems with neural networks is that they are a black box. So we, we, we design them with an architecture, and then we run them, and they get, I don't know, 80% accuracy on some task, and that's very good. And then we say no more about it. We now have a program that can classify these things at 80% accuracy. In many ways, we don't really care about how it did it, if it does it. Um, but if we want to improve these things beyond 80% and beyond 90% and get them better and better, it's a good idea to try and understand what's going on underneath. So there are some papers out there, Google are working on it, there are other papers as well, that are trying to understand what it is that the lowest layers of a network are doing and the highest layers of a network are doing for different tasks. Intuitively, the lowest layers are edges and things, and as we go up, hierarchical groups of these things, so buildings and so on. Um, so one thing you can do is you can, instead of maximizing this layer, which represents very high level objects, we can maximize one of the layers down here, which maximizes edges and things. So here's, a, here's another picture of Google Deep Dream that I've maximized a lower layer. Okay, so you can see that instead of starting to form objects, it's now just starting to form patterns of lines and textures. And that's because that's the only 
thing that's described at this lower level of a network. So now we're on Van Gogh. Yeah. Impre- right? Impressionism, so, right? So yeah, impressionism. Right? This is much better than I can paint as well. The idea is that the lower layers of a network are doing things like this, and the higher layers of a network are looking for more complex objects. That's basically what a neural network does. This network has been trained on somewhere around a thousand classes of objects, so cats, dogs, bikes, people, buildings, and so on. This network that I showed at the beginning is trained only on buildings, which is why many of the things that have been generated in it look like buildings. Often, some of the objects you see start to look very similar. So you've got a building here that looks like a building, and another one that looks kind of similar with this, with this spike on. And that's because the network's been trained on certain objects, and these objects get a good response, and then it make, maximizes those things. So the question was then, well, what if I want to generate an image that makes this look more like a cat, specifically a cat, rather than just cats and dogs and buildings and bikes and, and all these different things? So what we do is we put a cat image into it, into the network, and we find out which of these light up for a cat, specifically a cat. Right? And then we, instead of maximizing all of them, we maximize only those ones. Okay, so we're basically saying now, more of it please, but more of only the specific interesting cat ones. Right. Um, I chose cat because people on the internet have a lot of pictures of cats. They're very easy to obtain. So I put in a picture, here's some pictures of some cats that I put in. So when I put this into the image, into the neural network, it's going to classify this as a cat or multiple cats. And it's going to do that by finding combinations of features that look like cats. So if I pin down the learning to do this, I can start to make my image look more like a cat. So you can see there's some eyes have appeared, there's a kind of nose here. That looks, let's face it, it's not really a cat, but it's, it's more of a cat than the landscape was. It's a pretty weird image, all things considered. And this is at a high level. If we do the same thing for a lower layer, we can't get all that hierarchical sort of ears plus eyes plus nose. We can only get the low level things. So we can say, do this one, which is almost entirely fur and eyes, right? So you can see that the clouds kind of look a bit like fur, so it's made them look more like that. And the eyes are all down here. So this is a, a different kind of image that we produce by trying to make it look a bit like a cat, but only at a low level. So, you know, what are the low level features that make a cat? Okay, how strange. Um, and finally, you can do it for people. So I put in a picture of some people's faces and uh, out we get is an incredibly weird picture of sort of weird hybrid baby things that kind of gives me nightmares. You could argue, in some ways, we're getting an intuition about what the lower levels do and what the higher levels do. Predominantly, it's just for fun. Right? There are other papers that do outputting of network layers and trying to work out what it is that each layer is doing. But in this way, it just kind of generates cool images. So if you want to use Google Deep Dream, you just need an input image and maybe a reference image like a cat to, to target it towards. But really, you don't need much more than that. And then you can just get going on it. Is it, is it a website or something? Is there a... So No, so actually, it's, it's um, Python code that goes into CAFE, which is a deep learning library. Um, so that's how I generated these images. Uh, people have obviously put a website front end on this, so it's very easy to find websites that do the same thing, but in actual fact it will just be running the source code back behind the scenes. If you look through the source code, it's actually not very long, because this process of, of back propagation is already coded up in these libraries, so all you need to do is tell it, instead of minimising the C, we want to maximise the value of these things, and you just change a few numbers around and send it backwards through the network. Um, it's, you know, not, it, it, it sounds complicated, but really actually it isn't that complicated once you, once you actually look at the code. And you can start to see this uh, quite easily. What we here is a piece of 16 mil film. You can see that actually you've got lots and lots of individual images. And each of those images we refer to as a single frame. And when you projected this film, you literally...